Tucker Carlson is out with episode three of his new Twitter show. This time he focuses on former President Donald Trump's classified documents indictment case. Let's watch some of that. Washington, that was just noise. None of it really rated. Identity politics doesn't mean much to permanent Washington. What matters then and now is foreign policy, the invasions and occupations and proxy wars, the decisions that determine which global populations will thrive and which will die, the policies that come with trillion dollar price tags, the ones that over time have made the counties around DC the richest suburbs in the world. In Washington, that's what actually matters. And it's obvious when you look carefully. When there's a debate about anything else, for example, the debt ceiling, both sides take their assigned positions and they start yelling. But when Congress decides to start a war, no matter how foolish or counterproductive or obviously disconnected from America's core interests that war may be, when that happens, the leaders of both parties automatically jump behind it like circus clowns. And here is a little bit more from that same Twitter show. Direction and then come home. How are things looking? Well, they should look great. The federal government spent six and a half trillion dollars last year. That's more than any government has ever spent, ever. So at the very least, you would expect pristine public roads. Oh no, that's not what you see when you drive around this country. There are potholes and Jersey barriers everywhere. Looks like Tegucigalpa before the Chinese decided to rebuild the infrastructure of Honduras. We don't have China buying our roads. So they're falling apart. You'd think the people you would pass on your road trip would look happy and prosperous. Again, this is a very rich country, but a lot of them don't. Quite a few appear to be strung out on drugs. You see them shuffling by shuttered storefronts in small towns. And you wonder, as you see all of this, where did all the money go? It's certainly not here. Well, it's in Washington. It's in Fairfax and Loudoun counties and in leafy, perfectly manicured Northwest DC. And of course, a huge chunk of it went to Ukraine, to Zelensky and his friends. Not because you voted for that, you didn't vote to give it to them, you never would, but because Joe Biden and his many allies, from Chuck Schumer to Mitch McConnell to Paul Ryan and every single news anchor on all of television, all of them believe that Ukraine, its borders, its future, its infrastructure are all more important than the town that you live in. They sincerely think that. So, very interesting clip, kind of a defense of Trump in some sense, the beginning. Um, Tucker says a lot of things I agree with, um, that Trump did articulate a clear uh, break with, with the GOP's foreign policy goals, with the Bush-era neoconservatism, and as Tucker explains in that clip, was um, hamstrung over and over again by people, by the permanent federal bureaucracy and then people within his own administration, people he picked, who Tucker says flattered him because he's an easily flattered person and distracted him and got him to not follow through on his commitments to actually change foreign policy all the way. Now, from my perspective, I, I think that shouldn't be, in a, I, I think that's substantially true. It should not be a defense and excuse of Donald Trump. Like, given that that's what happened over the Trump administration, my question, and my question would be to, to conservatives who, who, ca who care as I do about those foreign policy changes, why would we repeat this experiment with Donald Trump when he proved that he, ca he cannot, he's, he, right now, people are upset that the deep state is like, you know, s pulling his head underwater. Didn't he prove he's not the person to, to beat them, to change Washington? Right. Didn't he demonstrate that his ego, his lack of, of, of strategic thinking, his inability to pick the right people and instead pick flatterers or people he saw on TV who he thought were good, like John Bolton, that's literally why he picked John Bolton, someone whose foreign policy views are completely at odds with everything Trump said he, he stood for? He said, oh yeah, he's really good on, he's really good on Fox. He saw him on Fox, mm -hmm. not when, when he was doing the, you know, he did that uh, that aerobic product that had been on uh, on Shark Tank, the the board where you like, where you stand on it. You don't know what I'm talking about. It, <laughs> find me that find me that clip, <laughs> I'm producers. So sorry. I want to yes um, and you, and, but I don't anyway, know that one. That's why he put John Bolton in his administration, and John Bolton worked steadfastly to undermine Trump, and is working even still to under you know back on cable news talking about how everything Trump did was bad and wrong and, and put Americans at risk, etc. So. That is what happened. That's the true story of how it went down. But I, I need to turn now to someone, someone new who has those views and then also has a strategy to implement them. Well, so in case it's not clear from the clips that we showed, the 
gestalt of this thing is about uh, Trump's indictment. And the story that Tucker Carlson tells he is that Trump, they, they decided to indict Trump. The decision by the deep state or what have you was mm -hmm. made the second that he, at a 2016 Republican primary debate, it invade against the war in Iraq and the weapons of mass destruction and the unjustified nature of that conflict. Um, and that that was an impermissible thing to say. And since then, people have flattered themselves into his employ and ingratiated themselves to him as a part of a long game to flip on him when he becomes weak and to control the you know military apparatus such that the status quo is maintained. And I completely agree with your Point, Rob. Well, for what? First, of all, I'll say I think it's very smart rhetorically to mm -hmm. try to make this not about the fact that Donald Trump did an own goal and simply didn't return documents and is now facing criminal indictment and potentially jail because he simply didn't want to return documents to the National Archive and turn it into something a lot bigger and something that Republicans might be more willing to defend, which is this idea that he is a break from the military-industrial complex and is willing to stop doing so much uh, military spending and bring it home and do domestic spending. But there's two problems with that. One is that, to your point, Robbie, Donald Trump at no point seemed to put up any fight against the right. so-called operators who were who were in his administration, he picked them. And not only did he pick them, he didn't seem to have any trouble with them once they were in that position. I didn't see him coming out and speaking to the public in a way that he is very able to do. We see him having a direct line on Twitter and social media and very willing to say his piece and to say what's on his heart. He didn't say, oh, my advisors are telling me to raise the military budget, but I really don't want to come with me, people rally at the White House. We all know he has the ability to say, come rally at the White House at no point at, 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 during his four years in office or since has he protested that. Every single year, there are military budget increases that, that, that um, Barack Obama, Donald Trump, Joe Biden, all of them sign off on, and that is a bipartisan effort. Second of all, I'm increasingly troubled by this pairing of domestic spending and military spending for two reasons. One is that as someone who believes in MMT, I think that is a, fl a faulty economic understanding of our, our ability to pay and the idea that we need to cut military spending to spend domestically. I think we do need to cut military spending for reasons other than budget reasons. But secondly, even if you don't are an MMT e economist, the reality is that when it comes to actually approving domestic spending, Republicans repeatedly say no. We just had this debt ceiling crisis during which zero Republicans were willing to cut the military budget or offer that as right. a plan forward. And instead, they were all salivating, very happy at the idea of cutting basic social, net, social safety programs for poor and working class people. So to the extent that Tucker Carlson in this clip is talking about passing people who are drug addicted and sad and poor on the side of the road, bad infrastructure potholes in the street, the I-95 crumbling uh, on the way to Pennsylvania. There is no effort to fund health care, to expand uh, Medicare and Medicaid, to support rehabilitation programs. To, there was even some fight over the bifurcated infrastructure I mean, bill, the part that was just infrastructure. Billions of dollars going to these programs as they exist currently. And, and so what is the argument then? They don't need to be funded more? If you believe, and if Tucker believes that those programs do not need to be funded more, then he is lying. Oh, I don't when know he said, Wait a minute. Tucker believes. Then, he's, then he is lying. If, if, the, if the rationale to, well, we're already spending and it's not working, if that's what you believe, that spending doesn't help, then why is he arguing that we need to cut military spending so that we can do domestic spending? I think that's a lie. So while I agree with him about the problem with military spending, so many of these Republicans are using that messaging because they know Americans want more domestic spending. They want to lower their health care costs. They're tired of paying more for health care than everyone else in the world and getting low or, or every other similarly industrialized country and getting worse health outcomes. But the Republicans who are using that messaging to appeal to a populist audience that is sincere in their belief, has, ne has there's absolutely no evidence in Trump's record or beyond that that is what they would do if suddenly we did cut military spending or if we didn't cut military spending. Right. I think we should cut military spending because I don't like the military policies we have. So I want to empower less of these decisions. Also, I want to cut government spending across the board so we can cut military spending. I don't, I, we, this is probably a longer conversation that we can have before we wrap here, but I, I think probably there are 
structural issues and policy issues going into health care and social, it's not really, I, I imagine we could spend less money and still have crappy care and spend more money and also have crappy care. And there's probably more we have to change about the fundamentals of this. Like, We do have to change, gets, the, change the fundamentals. The right. problem is that people are paying so much to the middlemen, the health insurance sure. companies, that they could be paying, They could take. you could take the money, this is how other countries do it. You can take the money that you're currently paying to your health care premium, half it, pay that money to the government in terms of the national health care program, the Medicare for all program, to pay, fund an expansion of Medicare, both in terms of everybody being able to now take advantage of Medicare and also the benefits included in Medicare would be bigger, broader, hearing, dental care, uh, eye care. No more of this, you got health insurance, but somehow dental insurance is different because your teeth aren't in your body, you're having to pay thousands of dollars out of pocket for ear and impl hearing implants the way so many older Americans know they have to do. And that would save the average American money because, again, you're, you're just paying the money directly to the service and not to the health care provider. And by the way, the way we have it set up now, the second you miss a payment, you don't get coverage. Plus, you're paying all of those premiums. And when you get sick, you still have to pay more because you have to meet your deductible right. the and indirect, co-pays and all of that. The indirect part of our system is bad and needs reform. I got, a, I got a doctor's bill the other day for a test they did, and I, I just paid my copay. But the test, it was a co they because I went to the doctor's office, they gave me a COVID test. And that cost... At the doctor's office, it costs like a hundred or more dollars. That's what they, they didn't charge me that. They charged the insurance company yep. that. Um, a COVID test at CVS, which is, there's one beneath my building, costs like 15 or 20 bucks. Yep. So why does it cost them, you know, 10 times that to do at the doctor's office? But again, that's being billed to the insurance company. So that, like, th that is the kind of structural issues yes. we need to address. Yes, 100%. Yeah. We'll have more rising right after this.